This video is an introduction to the concept of load combinations. We won't go thoroughly through all the different load types. We'll focus on dead, live, and earthquake. In design, we need to test various combinations of load types. The exact combinations are stipulated by the code. The way we combine them is by scaling and then adding combinations of the various load types. The load combinations that involve dead, live, and earthquake loads are given here. 1.4 dead, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, 1.2 dead plus or minus earthquake, 0.9 dead plus or minus earthquake. The dead load only case usually doesn't govern. It really only governs in the rare case that you have very small live loads. Earthquake loads need to be added or subtracted because the earthquake can act in both directions. And usually when we draw the forces on the structure, the earthquake is pointing in one direction but there's nothing saying that the forces can't act in the other direction. So when we consider the earthquake load case, we need to consider it acting in both directions. Once we compute all the different load combinations, we need to select from the answers what the worst case or worst cases are from all the different load combinations we used. How do we know what is the worst case? We'll see an example of that next. In this example, We'll take a simple portal frame subjected to vertical and lateral load. The frame is shown to the right. It's a portal frame with a pin at one end and a roller at the other, a width B and a height H. Under gravity loads, we'll assume that all the gravity loads are captured by a distributed load W acting over the beam. And if that's the case, the reactions at the pin and at the roller are W times the width B divided by two so the load gets split evenly by symmetry. For the lateral loads, we'll assume there's a single lateral load F acting at the top of the frame. We can calculate the reactions as they're shown in the diagram. If either of these two calculations causes you a little bit of discomfort, you can pause the video now and work through the equilibrium to make sure that you believe that these are indeed the reactions. Now we'll work with numbers in this problem. We'll assume that there's a uh, dead load of 0.1 kips per foot. There's a live load of 0.3 kips per foot. The earthquake load F is 3 kips. The width B is 25 feet and the height H is 12 feet. And if we plug all of these values in to the diagrams above, we find the following calculated reactions at the pin. I'll be focusing only on the pin in this example. The values are given in kips. So I've indicated in the table the horizontal and vertical component of the force on the pin in the cases of dead, live, and earthquake. We'll notice that a positive value indicates compression, which is common for foundations. Let's go through the details of how this table was calculated. Start in the dead load case. We have the dead load of 0.1 kips per foot, the width B of 25 feet. We plug those into the values given in the diagram, place the values in the table. For instance, 0.1 kips per foot times 25 feet is 2.5 kips, divided by 2 is 1.25 kips. For live load, take the value of the live load and the width B, plug them into the right expression in the diagram, place the values in the table. For the earthquake load, take the value of the earthquake load, the value of width, the value of height, plug them into the appropriate expressions in the diagram, and place the result in the table. The earthquake load, you'll notice, generates both a horizontal and a vertical component. The gravity loads generate only a vertical component. We'll take the computed reactions at the pin and use those values to compute the load combinations. We've simply repeated the table here, and we can calculate all of the following load combinations. Each of these columns is obtained by scaling the corresponding column in the table above and adding them as indicated. We'll do an example calculation. We'll look at 1.2 dead minus the earthquake load, looking only at the vertical component. So we have our expression there, 1.2 dead minus the earthquake load, 1.2 times the dead load of 1.25, subtracting the earthquake load of minus 1.44, the two negatives create a positive, and we have a resulting load of 2.94. And we would continue in this way 
to fill out all the remaining items in the table. This is a good moment for you to pause and calculate the rest of the values in the table so that you can be sure that you know how to complete the calculation. It's time to finish the problem by looking at what is the worst case out of all of these. So we have six different load combinations here. Each of those load combinations consists of a horizontal and a vertical component. Some are going to be more severe, some are going to be less severe. Which is the worst case? I'd like you to pause now and jot down your guess for what you think is the worst case or what are the worst cases. Now at this stage it's probably just going to be a total guess. Guess something and then we can see if your guess is right or wrong. So you at least have a guess about what the worst case is. These are the ones that I see. First, 1.2 dead and 1.6 live has the largest compression, the largest vertical force of 7.5 kips. If I'm designing a foundation, I want to make sure that that foundation can support the largest compressive load that it might experience. Next, the load case 1.2 dead minus earthquake has the worst combined compression and shear force. The compression of 2.94 kips is significantly smaller than the previous case. However, there's also a shear force involved. So perhaps this load combination is actually more severe. Lastly, one of the load cases actually has a tensile force or uplift. And uplift is very different for our foundation than compression. So we need to look at that one as well. The force magnitude of 0.32 kips is much lower than 7.5 kips, but because it's in uplift or tension, it also needs to be designed for. So this gives us three potential worst cases, and they all need to be considered. So to continue the process, I would then provide these numbers to the geotechnical engineer, and the geotechnical engineer would design the foundation to be able to support all of these three different load combinations. So we'll finish with a summary. Load combinations are used to find the loads used for design. In this example, we saw load combinations for dead load, live load, and earthquake loads. But there are many more that we haven't gone into, so just be aware of that. There are load combinations involving wind loads, roof live loads, snow loads, rain loads. And so this is only an initial sampling of what you'll need to do in the end. When we apply the load combinations, we saw that we need to analyze the structure several times. In this example, we analyzed it once under the gravity load, once under the lateral load. If the situation were more complicated, we might have to do a third or a fourth or a fifth analysis. We then take the results of these various analyses and scale and sum them in different ways. Once we've done the scaling and summing, we need to use some judgment to identify the worst cases. There's a lot that we haven't done yet. For instance, I haven't yet considered the forces at the roller, although I can tell you that they won't govern. But more importantly, we haven't looked at internal forces. We haven't looked at shear force, bending moment, or axial force in the columns or in the beam. And this will be the subject of our next video, that is the bending moment in the beam.